Good everyone. Good evening, everyone. This is Jackie Wright uh, with the San Francisco Black Film Festival. I can tell you right now that this is not business as usual for us, not only because we are having this wonderful play, excerpts from this play, Riot, Atlanta 1906, uh, it's because of what we are experiencing in real time. And in real time, we have lost our leader. Callie O'Ray, unfortunately, passed last night. We got the word about um, 8.50 California time, around 11.50 Atlanta time. And I can just say it's not business as usual for us. Uh, it is a time of mourning. But one thing I do know, because of the spirit of Calio Ray and his mother, Ave Montague, that began the San Francisco Black Film Festival in 1998, Knowing their spirits, I know that they would want us to go on with this presentation, this live talk at San Francisco Black Film Festival. So I appreciate all of you joining in. Um, and I so thank everyone from Atlanta for um, coming in as well. Uh, just to give you a little bit about uh, Callie O'Ray, he and his wife, Katira Crossley, took over the San Francisco Black Film Festival in 2009 uh, after his mother passed. His mother had been working on a presentation with the KBLX radio station in San Francisco. And it was the Obama West inauguration party and event that she had been working on. And a few days after that, she unfortunately um, passed. And they came from Atlanta and they, of course, uh, took care of the ceremonies and honoring of, of Ave, who was a very dear friend and an arts impresario who worked with uh, organizations like the Lorraine Hansber Hansberry Theater and just so many other nonprofits. They decided to go ahead and continue the dream of Avi Montague, which was to provide a platform for emerging and established filmmakers that would express the African diaspora experience. And they did an excellent job. Uh, if you Google San Francisco Black Film Festival, you'll see all sorts of great events that have happened with great friends like Danny Glover, um, Mario Van Peebles, and Robert uh, Townsend and so many others. So we are in mourning right now. We are devastated that we have just found this out as of a few hours ago. It hasn't even been 24 hours. And so at this time in honor and respect of Callie O'Ray, we're gonna take a moment of silence. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, taking that moment to recognize a wonderful, bright spirit. When you look at the San Francisco uh, Black Film Festival, even this uh, image from the website, that is the work of Callie O'Ray of putting together that, um, that website. And you can take a look at it. The San Francisco uh, Bayview newspaper, it has a new look, brought them up to the uh, the new century with the look that uh, Callie O'Ray gave them. So that's another example. If you were to Google uh, San Francisco Bayview newspaper, you'd see his handiwork all over. So we're going to miss him in so many ways with his spirit, his drive, his determination, and his doggedness when it came to making sure that the images of Black people were positive and that the up and coming filmmakers would have an opportunity to express their thoughts along with uh, some of the named friends of the San Francisco Black Film Festival. 
You know, it's really interesting that um, we are emanating from both San Francisco and Atlanta, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, Kali Array and Katira Crossley came to um, San Francisco from Atlanta, and Atlanta was very dear to them. And so as our condolences go out to Katira and uh, her sons and all of their family and the friends of the San Francisco Black Film Festival, know that you in Atlanta are bringing a kind of a, a balm of Gilead to us, uh, an extra feeling of comfort uh, because you are from Atlanta, a city that they also loved as well. And so uh, to our audience, um, thank you for being here, the ones that are with us live and the ones that are going to be joining us uh, via this recording. Uh, we really appreciate your presence. And I just want to introduce uh, the people that will be participating today. Uh, the cast includes Charlie Charles, and she is um, an actor and singer, and she was born and, and raised in, apartheid, in the apartheid South Africa. So we're really very pleased to have her. Hi. And then we have with us also Russell James Scott III. He is a 2016 graduate of the University of Georgia. And he's been uh, making quite a name for himself around Atlanta with a number of plays, including I, Aida. So um, we thank you for being with us also, James. Russell, rather. Thank you, Jackie. Yes. And then, of course, we have uh, the lady of the hour that we can thank for uh, the place of where the, uh, the emanation of this recording is coming from, and that is Frosina Bird. She's the Associate Artistic Director of Academy Theater. So, Frosina, thank you so very much for your participating and also yielding your space as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be a part of it. Okay. And last but not least, of course, is the writer, director, Micah Penn. And he's a veteran professional actor and former stage director who has worked more than 35 years on stage and screen. And he's done critically acclaimed work and award-winning work in Atlanta, New York City, uh, Los Angeles in both comedy and drama. And we loved him here on the West Coast uh, with his work with the Pan-African <laughs> Film Festival for about 10 years as a cinema coordinator. So we welcome you and we welcome your work. And Micah, we yield the floor to you. Well, thank you, Jackie. And thank you for everybody who is here participating with us. Um, and it's nice to be back in Atlanta doing theater after so many years of doing film uh, there on the West Coast. But I'm very, very grateful to Jackie Wright uh, for inviting us to be able to participate with San Francisco Black Film Festival today. So we're going to have our, um, our uh, guest, well, our host uh, of the day, Fresina, start us off in our reading. Uh, we're going to read through various excerpts um, parts of the play, and um, those different sections will cover different areas of things that are pertinent to what's going on with us here in this country today, um, even as they were 100 plus years ago. So, Fresina, if you would start us off. Now, most people know of Atlanta because of the American Civil War but there was another war there. It was in all of the papers, but none of the history books. You see, this war was not between states, but between neighbors, white and black. They called it a riot, but it was much more than that. I know, because I was there. He stops in front of the statue of Henry Grady. At the end of the 19th century, newspaperman Henry Grady lectured throughout the country on the New South, with Atlanta at the heart of it. Northern companies and banks invested heavily in the city. This city of a hundred hills, as one man called it, 
was growing by leaps and bounds. Only Los Angeles, California was growing faster. He continues on his way, passes various local citizens and nods to each of the folks as he walks. A new idea was also adopted by black Americans of this era, the new Negro for a new century. And it was driving African Americans to excel at every opportunity, clergymen, educators, businessmen, and everyday people as well. Lights up on a Maddie Adams restaurant. Maddie Adams, a middle-aged black woman is dressed for church wearing her winter coat. She stops by her restaurant to search for her Bible and to check on her daughter, Alice Kelly, mid thirties, and Alice's 10 year old son, Junior. They are serving breakfast to much of the Saturday night crowd coming over from Decatur Street. Everyone shudders from the cold air each time the door opens. The entire room greets Maddie as she enters. How y'all doing this morning? Several people answer, good morning and hey, Miss Maddie, all at once. Maddie is searching for her Bible behind the lunch counter and not finding it. Alice is waiting on their handsome teenage cousin, Evans, who is preparing to leave. Alice, honey, have you seen my Bible? I can't seem to find it this morning. No, ma'am, I don't recall. No, you tell cousin Johnny, I'm gonna be looking for her to come by soon, Evans. I will. Hey, Evans. Hey, cousin Maddie. You on your way home? Yes, ma'am. Well, you tell Johnny and Roy I said, hey. I will, see y'all. As Evans leaves, a regular customer, Arthur Skillet Johnson, a dark-skinned middle-aged man entered hungover from the night before. He takes a seat at an empty table, shivering and nursing his aching head. Well, well, look what the cat dragged in. Maddie turns to see Skillet. Excuse me, but tables are reserved for paying customers. Oh, Miss Maddie. That was just that one time. I told you somebody stole my money and I paid Alice back. <laughs> I know you did. I just like to remind you, you need to be more responsible, Mr. Skillet. It was probably that little fast tail girl you've been going with. You need to leave that little girl alone before you end up in a ditch with a knot in your head down on Decatur Street doing God knows what and everybody else knows it too. Who you keep in company with, Skillet? That little Sanders girl, Flora. Arthur Johnson, you have been down on Decatur Street with little Flora Sanders. She ain't no more than 16 or 17 years old and you a grown man. No, no Miss Maddie, she 19. She grown? I don't go around with no cheering. She got a little place of her own and we just friends. And no matter what some people want you to think. I've been knowing that family ever since they first moved up here from Albany, Georgia. Mr. Barron is a hard working man. Got a good job working for the railroad. And you say little Floor living down on Decatur Street? Lord have mercy. Henrietta must be sick about it. Atlanta for all of its advances, like all major cities, had its areas of ill repute. Lights up on Decatur Street and its saloons and clientele. Decatur Street, saloons, bars, and lunchrooms, owned by blacks and whites can be found here. Patrons here are indiscriminate in their choice of saloon or eatery. Hustlers, bluesies, gamblers, and transients are all congregated along these avenues. White men looking for black female companionship found it here. Fights and other domestic disturbances happen daily, or rather nightly. Many who frequented the Decatur Street area often found themselves in the city recorder's court. It was ruled over by Judge Nash Broyles, the superintendent of law enforcement in Atlanta. His court brought in more than $1,000, $100,000 a year in fines. Lights up on Judge Broyles' court. Judge Broyles' courtroom is teeming with people lawyers, cops, defendants, and families. Judge Broyles bangs his gavel. Next case, Macon Clark, black defendant Clark steps forward before the judge. 
says here you are charged with vagrancy. No such thing, Your Honor. I was tending to my own business, waiting on a friend of mine who was taking her sweet time as usual. Then this officer comes up to me and tells me to move on. I say, I'm waiting on a friend. I ain't no vagrant. He didn't like my answer. So he tells me to move or he gonna arrest me. I said, I ain't done nothing. He said, is I gonna move? I said, no, I ain't. I'm waiting on a friend. And here we is. <sighs> Listen here. Next time an officer of the law tells you what to do, just do it. You've been listening to too much of that Booker T. Washington. Mr. Clark, you're ordered to pay $10.75 for vagrancy. He bangs his gavel. Next case. That year, the governor's race was front and center, and newspaperman Hoke Smith of the Atlanta Journal and rival ha Clark Howe of the Constitution not only competed in print, but also with the leading gubernatorial candidates of the Democratic Party. As African Americans were trying to move forward with new ideas, Hoke Smith chose an old one for his campaign. Lights up on Hoke Smith and his aide in a room at the Piedmont Hotel in downtown Atlanta. Smith motions to his aide to get the door. He opens the door to find populist Don Tom Watson standing on the doorway. The aide is surprised and turns to Smith to get the okay. Smith smiles, waves Watson in, and dismisses his aide. Come on, Tom. Good to see you. Would you like a bourbon or a scotch? This whiskey comes from Tennessee, a fine sipping whiskey. No, thank you, a little early for me. Well, I'm certainly appreciative of you taking the time to come by. Have a seat. The two men sit. Watson is suspicious, Smith in total control. Now, Tom, I know you've had a hard way to go and a hard way to get there with the party, I know. But everybody in this state knows that you stand up for the everyday hardworking man. And that's what I'm going to need to beat Howell and the boys. They let the railroads run this town, so I'm giving them the town and taking the state. I've already got legislator Hardwick with me. I've let him know that I'll sign his disfranchisement bill as soon as it comes to my desk. And he knows I can get it through the legislature. Both of you are vitally important to my campaign, but you, sir, are the key. You know every country, man, woman, boy, and girl in this state. I want to work with you, and I want you to be with me to win this state. And in the process, the Democratic Party, Democratic Party in the state will be yours. Watson mulls this over a moment, then on to Smith. You're serious. Now, Hoke, you know what I stand for, and you're right about me and the party. I will be there for the party, but if you're really serious about working with me on my issues, my way, okay, maybe we can do some things. Tom, I'm with you 1,000%. Watson I. Smith then laughs, laughs to himself. Smith smiles, but is puzzled. What's funny? Hoke, you've been doing fine up to now, but to turn this corner, you're gonna have to do the same thing to Howell that they did to me back in the 90s. Use the nigger. It means cutting some old ties, taking back some things from your Grover Cleveland days, that stuff with Turner. Tom, that was just politics, like it was with you and the colored farmers back then. I take it you're prepared for the backlash? Oh, I'm counting on it. This is where having a major newspaper in your pocket comes in handy. Lights up on the Equal Rights Convention. The Venerable William J. White of Augusta, editor of the Georgia Baptist, an organizer of the convention, comes to the podium. My friends and fellow citizens, 40 years have elapsed since President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation was made effective in Georgia by the surrender of the Confederate Army. For 40 long years, we have struggled and toiled, trying to make it manifest to the world that our enslavement was not of God and that as free men, 
we are worthy to stand side by side of the free men of other races. The American bondmen, when emancipated, were largely left at the mercy of their former masters. Legal and illegal discriminations against the colored man of being the ruling people of the South until the condition already alarming is becoming more so every day. As individuals, we may have very different views, but since the conditions are racial, it is the duty of the race to decide what is best to do. We meet today as Georgians to consider matters of vital interest to us as citizens of this state. We come with no ill will, but determined purpose. With the men and women here assembled, the address you will give out to the white people of Georgia will be sure to have a beneficial effect. Let us present our case to them from our standpoint in a straightforward, manly way. God will take care of the rest. From the late century into the middle 20th century, white supremacy in America manifested itself in a heinous rage called lynching. This lawless mob violence was carried out with guns, knives, rope people alive. Mrs. Rebecca Latimer Felton, a women's rights advocate, was also an outspoken advocate of this criminal act. Lights up on Rebecca Latimer Felton. When there is not enough for in the to organize a crusade against sin, nor justice in the courthouse to promptly punish crime, nor manhood enough in the nation to put a sheltering arm about innocence and virtue, if it needs to protect women's dearest possession, the ravening human beast, then I say lynch a thousand times a week if necessary. Lights up on the pool home. A mob gun, knives, etc. Mr. Poole and Mrs. Poole tend to Annie, who lies on the living room couch. Just then, a group of men and one of the sheriff's deputies appear with Frank Carmichael. Mr. Poole comes down to the TM. There a minute, grabs Carmichael, then he and cousin TM lead him to the front of the house. Annie, can you come out on the porch? Yes. Carmichael is terrified now. He realizes what is going on. Poole goes and stands by Annie to hold her up as she comes out. TM holds on to Carmichael. She looks a moment, then speaks. Oh, that's the... No, no. Lights out. Multiple gunshots ring out. Lights up as the newspaper boys come through the audience with papers. Evening news, get the Atlanta evening news. Angry citizens pursue black brute who attacks Mrs. Chapin. Read all about it. Extra, extra, second assault, second assault. Miss Frank Arnold accosted by a Negro on a back porch. Get your evening news, extra, extra. Extra, extra, Mrs. Alma Allen grabbed by burly Negro fiend. Extra, read all about it. Extra, extra, Mrs. Maddie Holcomb startled by Negro staring through window. Get your evening news here, third assault. A middle-aged white man snatches a paper from a newspaper boy and jumps onto a wooden box. He holds up a copy of the Atlanta Evening News with the caption, third assault. Men of Atlanta, how long are we going to put up with this? Our daughters, our sisters, now even our elderly mothers being outraged and shamed by these low down niggers. Are we going to sit here and let Sheriff Nelms and Judge Broyles pussyfoot around them? Let them go free? Or are we going to stand up like men and protect our women? These are our wives, our sweethearts, our kin. What kind of men are we to let these things go on in our city? We're supposed to be the great city of the South, but we let our women be attacked by these savage dogs, mad dogs that we let run amok. It's time to be men, put dead savages, and damn them all to hell. The crowd shouts. Just then, a young 
Hey, a nigga just knocked a woman down and snatched her purse. Let's go get him, boys. It's time to put an end to these niggas. Just kill them. Kill them all and be rid of them. The crowd cheers. Lights out. The theater is completely dark. A black man is chased by a group of whites with guns who shoot him to pieces. A policeman ran, falls, and leaves his feet. The mob comes up and wants to cut up his body for souvenirs. The cop pulls his revolver and keeps the mob at bay. Blackstock and Tally come up behind the group. We don't want to hurt. Just give us the nigger. I'll kill the first man that touches him. Be on your way now. Move along. Do it. Move along. Come on, George. We can take the cop's head aim at Sox's head. It's okay, boys. This one looks good to me. They grudgingly move on. A group of whites hang him on a light pole. They then stand back and empty their shotgun and revolvers into the man. A young white woman with her husband witnesses the crime and collapses. Her husband carries her off. Years earlier, after two black men were lynched in Louisiana, Bishop Henry McNeil Turner issued this statement. Lights up on Bishop Turner. The fiendish lynching of John Johnson and Archibald Jointry upon mere suspicion, while the African Methodist Episcopal bishops were meeting in New Orleans only a few miles from the scene of blood and death was most damnable. Let every Negro in this country with a spark of manhood in him supply his house with one, two, or three guns with a seven or a 16 shooter. And we advise him to keep them loaded and ready for immediate use. And when his domicile is invaded by bloody lynchers or any mob by day or by night, Sabbath or weekday, turn loose your missiles of death and blow your fiendish invaders into a thousand giblets. And hereafter, we shall speak it, preach it, tell it, and write it. Get your guns, Negroes, get guns, and may God give you good aim when you shoot. Lights up on David Howard's mortuary. The black mortician leads two other black men carrying a coffin into the back room of the mortuary. He checks the doors and makes sure the lights are low. Sit it down there. They set the coffin down. He takes a crowbar and pries open the top of the coffin. He takes out a couple of rifles and hands them to his companions who check the weapons to see that they are operating correctly. All this talk all summer long. They think we're going to be like Memphis, New Orleans, and Wilmington. Well, they got another thing coming. And deputies headed into Brownsville, determined to confront black men there. All right, men. Any colors you see with firearms, you order them to put them. Also, make sure you order any group you see to disperse and lay down any weapons they might have. You men who just got sworn in, follow the lead of the officers here next to you. Oliver, Heard, Eubanks, y'all are with me. All right, let's move out. A group of black men are patrolling the neighborhood. Y'all, it's pretty quiet. Hold on a minute, what's that? Hey, what's that? Looks like a mob. I don't think it's a mob. Yeah, it is. And they've seen us. We got to get over there. Come on. Officer Heard and Eubanks lead the way as they rush the black men. Lieutenant Pool fires on the group, which responds to the attack. Frank Fambro is hit and goes down. The action and dialogue are simultaneous. Throw up. Frank. The black men return fire. 
Immediately, four of the white men go down. The black men fall back as men on both sides are wounded. The men shout back and forth as the fire dudes. Pooh, heard, and Eubanks are down. Form up, form up. Give them a volley, boys. Lewis is down. Give them crackers hell, boys. Give them hell. Fighting is so intense that finally the whites fall back, leaving her's body where it lies. This gives the black men a chance to grab their wounded and disappear into the darkness. Lights linger on officer. Lights up on the meeting as Jones walks into the midst of the large gathering of white and black men. Chamber of Commerce Chairman Jones is flanked by Captain English, Mayor Woodward, Clark Howell, and attorney Charles Hopkins. Jones takes the lead in the discussion. The termination of the riot is simple. Keep both white and colored hard at work. Then they'll have no time to stand around the street corners. In my humble opinion, opening of the factories and workshops will do more to restore order than anything else. Men in the audience nod and agree with hear, hear. Attorney Charles Hopkins rises to speak. Gentlemen, these hooligans have ruined our good names in a single night. On Friday, the credit of Atlanta was good for millions of dollars in New York or Boston or any financial center. Today, we couldn't borrow 50 cents. The reputation we have been building up for years, gone in two short hours by hoodlums, and understrappers and white criminals. Innocent Negro men struck down in the streets for no crime whatsoever. Make no mistake, gentlemen, this is more than just a financial loss. It is a white race failure. The Negro race is a child race. We are a strong race, the guardians. We have boasted of our superiority and we have now sunk to this level. We have shed the blood of our helpless wards. The men who have been doing this rioting are godless men and have brought nothing but disgrace to our city. Men of Atlanta, I'm giving my pledge here and now to lead the way in condemning as strongly as the English language will allow this murder and vandalism in the pages of the Constitution. Thank you, sirs. One and all. We should be sure to take this time also to contribute monies to the families of the victims of this injustice. Immediately, the men gathered reached into their pockets as a few of others collect the money. In the midst of this, Dr. Penn stands. He waits silently as they all begin to take notice of him. Gentlemen, I have come here today to ask the protection of the white men of Atlanta. On last night, a mob of 10 men came to my home, some of whom I knew. As a physician, I have treated some of their family members professionally. They broke into my house to look for concealed weapons, they said. When they found none, they frightened and accosted, accosted my wife and little girl with my daughter begging them not to shoot her father. My life and that of my family have been so threatened that I have had to flee my own home. My life was spared by the good graces of a gentleman in a passing automobile who had compassion on me. What shall we do? We have been disarmed. So how shall we protect our lives and our property? If living a sober, industrious, upright life, accumulating property and educating my children as best as I know how is not the standard by which a colored man can live and be protected in the South, what is to become of him? If the kind of life I've lived isn't the kind you want, shall I leave and go north? New York world deploying the wave of lustful crime that had taken place before the riot. Jesse Max Barber read the statement and implored the world to allow him to respond. Barber picks up a newspaper, reads, then throws it away in disgust. John Temple Graves, 
assumes a grand air of fairness in his letter to the New York world. But in all of that pageantry of high sounding phrases, he seeks an excuse for a mob which was as lawless and as godless station. There has been a frightful carnival of newspaper lies. First, Hoke Smith, governor elect of Georgia, formerly supposed to be a Christian, transformed himself into a snake and for 18 months abused the Negro to the snarling riffraff of the state. The day before his election, the newspapers were a prominent Atlanta banker confided in this writer that it was all a trick to further fire race hatred so that Smith would be elected on his Negro hating platform. Black in their faces, knock down a few white women and flee the scene. One of the women who first claimed she was assaulted by a black burly brute because of family troubles. The day preceding the riot was one of fear and trembling. If a Negro met a white woman on the streets and she screamed, remember that Charles Daniel of the Atlanta News had far more than a month sought by every hellish device to precipitate a race war. Of the Ku Klux Klan had offered to reward lynchers and had written daily fire eating and reckless editorials against the Negro. Remember that Mr. Graves himself and classic style about the shadow of black terror. Remember that the Atlanta Journal had exhausted the vocabulary abusing the Negro while the Constitution was mum. There came these extras with alarming rapidity on Saturday night with headlines a foot deep there had to be some bloodletting. There was some bloodletting. The cause of this riot? Sensational newspapers and unscrupulous politicians. The remedy? An impartial enforcement of the laws of the land. The authorities must protect all people. And although the newspapers have not said so, Almost as many white people were killed and as many were wounded as colored people. Only 12 people were officially listed as having died in the riot. Among them were Barbara, Henry Welch, and Western Union messenger Frank Smith. Besides Officer Hurd, the only other official Caucasian fatality of the riot was a Mrs. Thompson a pregnant woman who witnessed the attack of two black men and died of a heart attack from the shock. This is also a separate account of a young man named Evans who was seen fighting off a group of attackers. Years later, however, mortician David Howard told a story to a friend that echoed the words of Jesse Max Barber. Lights up on a much older David Howard. They had brought me a body, what was supposed to be a Negro man. But when I started to prepare the body, I took off the clothes and it was a white man whose face was disguised to look like a Negro. I didn't know what to think. I called H.M. Patterson right away because in those days we were not supposed to handle white bodies. I'll tell you though, you have no idea how many white bodies they ended up making me bury in Negro cemetery because they didn't want the white people to know by the Negroes in the riot. I okay. Okay, so just to cap off the last of what Charlie said, uh, I think it got cut off. But it was that white people, they didn't want white people to know who was getting killed by the Negroes in the riot. And um, David Howard had to go out and bury them at night. Uh, so no one would find out. 
Uh, so that concludes our excerpts. And thank you guys for being patient with all of the um, bandwidth issues and the different dropouts and what have you. But thank you guys for listening. And Jackie, we'll give it back to you. Thank you, uh, Micah. I really appreciate it. Uh, there were a number of things that really uh, spoke to me um, as I was listening and everything. And I just really uh, appreciate your, uh, your play. And before we get into the talk back of, of, about the excerpts, uh, and it's a great job, uh, I want to just give people a listen to some of the sounds of what is happening in our time now. And let's just to position this sound um, that you're about to hear to what we just heard from you. So uh, let's, let's get right into it. Uh, and it's, it's emanating from Atlanta as well. So uh, here we go. I didn't want to come and I don't want to be here. Atlanta City Police Officer, um, <clears throat> my cousin is an Atlanta City Police Officer, and my other cousin, East Point Police Officer, and I got a lot of love and respect for police officers, down to the original eight police officers in Atlanta, that even after becoming police, had to dress in a YMCA, because white officers didn't want to get dressed with niggers. And here we are 80 years later. I watched a white officer assassinate a black man. And I know that tore your heart out. And I know it's crippling. And I have nothing positive to say in this moment. Because I don't want to be here. But I'm responsible to be here because it wasn't just Dr. King and people dressed nicely who marched and protested to progress this city and so many other cities. It was people like my grandmother, people like my aunts and uncles who were members of SCLC and NAACP, and in particular, Reverend James Orange, Mrs. Alice Johnson, and Reverend Love, who we just lost last year. So I'm duty bound to be here to simply say that it is your duty not to burn your own house down for anger with an enemy. It is your duty to fortify your own house so that you may be a house of refuge in times of organization. And now is the time to plot, plan, strategize, organize, and mobilize. It is time to beat up prosecutors you don't like at the voting booth. It is time to hold mayoral offices accountable chiefs and deputy chiefs. Atlanta is not perfect, but we're a lot better than we ever were, and we're a lot better than cities are. I'm mad as hell. I woke up wanting to see the world burn down yesterday because I'm tired of seeing black men die. He casually put his knee on a human being's neck for nine minutes as he died like a zebra in the clutch of a lion's jaw, and we watch it like murder porn over and over again. So that's why children are burning to the ground. They don't know what else to do. And it is the responsibility of us to make this better. Right now, we don't want to see one officer charged. We want to see four officers prosecuted and sentenced. We don't want to see targets burning. We want to see the system that sets up for systemic racism burnt to the ground. And as I sit here in Georgia, home of Stevens, Georgia, former vice president of the Confederacy, white man said that law, fundamental law stated that whites were naturally the superior race and the Confederacy was built on a cornerstone. It's called a cornerstone speech. Look it up. The cornerstone speech that blacks would always be subordinate. That officer believed that speech because he killed that man like an animal. In this city, officers have done horrendous things and they have been prosecuted. This city's cut different. In this city, 
you can find over 50 restaurants owned by black women. I didn't say minority, and I didn't say women of color. So after you burn down your own home, what do you have left but char and ash? CNN, Ted did a great thing. I love CNN. I love Cartoon Network. But I'd like to say to CNN right now, karma's a mother. Stop feeding fear and anger every day. Stop making people feel so fearful. Give them hope. I'm glad they only took down a sign and defaced a building and they're not killing human beings like that policeman did. I'm glad that they only destroyed some brick and mortar and they didn't rip a father from a son. They didn't rip a, fa a son from a mother like the policeman did. When a man yells for his mother in duress and pain and she's dead, he is essentially yelling, please, God, don't let it happen to me. And we watch that. So my question for us on the other side of this camera is after it burns, will we be left with charred or will we rise like a phoenix out of the ashes that Atlanta has always done? Will we use this as a moment to say that we will not do what other cities have done and in fact we will get better than we've been? We got good enough to destroy cash bonds. You don't have to worry about going to jail for some petty. We got smart enough to decriminalize marijuana. How smart are we going to be in the next 15 or 20 years to keep us ahead of this curve? So that much like when South Africa suffered apartheid, you had Andy and other politicians that could make sure that Atlanta said, Coca-Cola, we love you. But if you don't pull out of South Africa, we're going to leave. We're not going to drink Coca-Cola anymore. Coca-Cola jumped on their side and apartheid ended. So we have an opportunity now because I'm mad. I don't have any good advice. But what I can tell you is that if you sit in your homes tonight, instead of burning your home to the ground, you will have time to properly plot, plan, strategize, and organize and mobilize in an effective way. And two of the most effective ways is first taking your butt to the computer and making sure you fill out your census so that people know who you are and where you are. The next thing is making sure you exercise your political bully power and going to local elections and beating up the politicians that you don't like. You got a prosecutor sent your partner to jail and you know it was bullshit. Put a new prosecutor in there. Now's your election to do it. You want a different senator that's more progressive that pulls marijuana through? Now is the time to do that. But it is not time to burn down your own home. I love and I respect you. I hate I don't have more to say. I hate I can't fix it in a snap. I hate Atlanta's not perfect for as good as we are. But we have to be better than this moment. We have to be better than burning down our own homes. Because if we lose Atlanta, what else we got? We lose an ability to plot, to plan, to strategize, to organize, and to properly mobilize. I want you to go home. I want you to talk to 10 of your friends. I want you guys to come up with real solutions. I would like for the Atlanta City Police Department to bring back the Community Review Board one that Alice Johnson was formerly under, under Chief Turner. We need a review board here because we need to get ahead of it before an officer does some stupid shit. We need to get ahead of it. That's my recommendation to my mayor and my chief. Let's get a review board, let's get ahead of it and let's give them power. We don't need an officer that makes a mistake once, twice, three times and finally he kills a boy on national TV and the next thing you know the country is burning down. We don't need a dumbass president repeating what segregationists say. If you start looting, we start shooting. But the problem is some officers black and some people gonna shoot back. And that's not good for our community either. I love and respect you all. I hope that we find a way out of it because I don't have the answers, but I do know we must plot, we must plan, we must strategize, organize and mobilize. Thank you for allowing me some time to speak. I'd like to appreciate our chief for what she said on YouTube. I thought it was very bold to do. I'd like to appreciate our mayor for talking to us like a black mom and telling us to take our ass at home. And I'd like to talk, like to thank my friend for convincing me to come here. Now I defer to Joe Beasley now because he knows a hell of a lot more than we do. Thank you. So, uh, a lot was said uh, by Killer Mike just a few few months a uh, few months ago um, in Atlanta, and then also looking, Micah, at your your excerpts from your five um, act play, there were just so many things that um, re were repeating themselves. I, I, I heard a loop that was going on. 
What about you? Yeah, unfortunately, um, that was the thing I saw when I started to research this play and started to um, work on bringing this to life was how many things are systemically the same. Uh, they continue uh, in the white um, political, social political structure of this country, which is not just national, it's actually more often uh, municipal communities, small communities, whether that's rural communities, small cities, uh, whatever part of the country you find yourself in, you'll find some of these things um, are as they've always been. Uh, you still find we are sentenced in in disproportionately to the crime when you go to court. Uh, the police are still used as weapons against black citizens. Uh, one of the things, one of the scenes I liked in the play when I first came across the story of uh, Macon Clark, uh, this is actually a story that um, one of the historians had uh, recorded was this exchange between Mr. Clark and Nash Broyles. And the thing is, uh, it turns out vagrancy was a law that they had put in place that they were using as a bludgeon against just blacks all over the state of Georgia to the point where at the Equal Rights uh, Convention, they put that in specifically as one of the tenets of their proclamation that they wanted changed and they want it changed immediately. And these people did this in February of 1906 when they were talking about vagrancy is one of the things that we want systematically removed because it's being used as our, against men and women and people being sent into the uh, penal system for no good reason, mm -hmm. you know? So um, things like that are things that, um, very much uh, the police brutality, the um, misuse of force, the, um, you know, too quick to, to um, racially profile people. And just like Killer Mike, I have two cousins who are law enforcement officers. One of them is a re re retired police chief. He was telling me of a story of him being racially profiled going through another state. And <laughs> The way he handled it, my cousin is so, such a smart guy. Uh, the way he handled it, he didn't get upset. He asked the police officer for a couple of things. And just the questions he asked the man allowed the man to know that he was talking to another police officer and embarrassed the man to no end, um, told his bosses, don't fire him. Um, well, what I want you to do is have him do this. So he learns never to do this again, you know? Mm -hmm. And those are the kinds of things that we're going to have to have put in place. Now, we can't wait any longer. It's been a hundred years and they're doing the same thing they did a hundred years ago, you know? So there are a lot of things like that, Jackie, that, are, that just jumped out immediately. Yeah, um, you know, as, um, as Killer Mike was talking, as I was listening to uh, the various excerpts and everything, uh, like I said, it, it, it's a loop that's happening. It's almost like art um, imitating life, life imitating art. But in the case of your art, it is based on real stories. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's what makes your play that much more powerful. Uh, it's wonderful that uh, the San Francisco Black Film Festival has had this platform that we could just share a little bit of your your play. What's going to be the next steps in o order to get this message out uh, to let people say, this is nothing new. This has happened before. Are there going to be any productions in Atlanta and any other um, cities around the nation? Well, the hope was uh, this year to go to New York. <laughs> but unfortunately, uh, New York was so hard hit uh, and everything there is shut down um, because of my prior experience with theater in New York. Uh, it's absolutely the place for this kind of production. And it was written for that kind of theater experience. The play is written uh, to be an experience. Um, 
I think one of the things I mentioned to you previously is that it's a 1970s style play. And by that, I mean that um, the kinds of plays that we did in those days, you did not just on stage, but you did throughout the audience. This play is designed that way so that much of it takes place in the audience and envelops the audience at one point in the riot when it's at its height so that the audience members feel as trapped as the people who were caught up in the actual events that happened then in 1906 and unfortunately in cities across the country in subsequent years to that and various race riots that happened all over the country. As far as uh, where we go from here, um, the thing that seems to be uh, all the rage is streaming. Um, the hope is that we will be able to uh, stream a um, stage reading in a um, bigger, better setting where we can actually go through, read the entire play with um, people actually doing the characterizations as they would be done in a professional reading, uh, whether here in Atlanta or wherever it's done. And um, I'd like to have it televised, just the reading itself, because mm -hmm. I believe that uh, if we televise the reading and put it out there for people to see, I think just the power of what the story is will affect people's hearts and minds. And I think it's something that if the larger society can see it, um, especially, especially when we're talking about white people and politicians and the news media, um, the newspapers of that day were directly responsible for the rampage that happened on that first night. And uh, people should know that uh, the thing that happened in Atlanta back then was not a one day event. Uh, unlike Tulsa, Oklahoma in um, the 20s, that happened all in a day. This thing happened over the course of a week and the hostilities did not die down for an entire calendar year. They were afraid that this thing was gonna flare up again which happened the last week of September, they were afraid it was gonna flare up again at Christmas. And there were efforts made all over the city um, by black and white leaders who had come together for the first time after the riot um, to make sure that it didn't flare up and they didn't go back to everybody getting their guns again. Um, so it took an entire calendar year for those feelings to die down. And I think it would benefit people to see this televised nationally um, so that Blacks and especially whites and people in the power structures mm -hmm. of the cities and in police departments can see that this is nothing new. And you all need to see yourselves and understand your part in um, keeping this history going, keeping this cycle going. Somebody has to break the cycle. Uh, but very often people, when they can't see themselves, they don't realize how caught up into the thing that they are. Mm -hmm. So I, so for me personally, um, that's my hope for the next uh, step in this and the evolution of it. And hopefully a calendar year or so from now, uh, there will be a stage production. Great. But that's, that's what we look for. Great, yeah, because you know, that, that whole media piece, and that was something I just thought that it was very in interesting that Killer Mike uh, also called out CNN uh, mm -hmm. in that in this discussion, and so your play brings up the fact that there is an issue with what is being fed by the media, and then here it is this day it's happening as well. You know, I want to give an opportunity for our audience to be able to ask a question as well. But I thought before we do that, uh, we'd go to uh, some of to the cast to see if they had anything to, to mention. And I uh, would like to just acknowledge, I don't know if she'll be able to speak with us uh, or not, but Brenda Porter uh, is also on the line and she had in, assisted you all uh, in mm -hmm. this, this effort. And Brenda is an actor and a director of uh, the Impact Theater of Atlanta. So we're just so pleased to have you, Brenda. And if you get an opportunity, you can raise your hand and uh, <laughs> open up your mic and speak if you'd like. But right now, um, 
to the ones that were reading. Uh, if anybody wants to, Charlie, uh, Frasina, and, uh, and uh, Russell, if you want to make some comments about uh, the impact of your, what you read and then current today, uh, you're welcome to do so or not. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you choose. Guys. I just want to uh, say I, one thing. Oh. Go ahead. <laughs> I, I just want to say one thing. Uh, coming from apartheid South Africa, born into it, and listening and reading Micah's play, uh, I am just really happy that I can experience and be part of the changes that are occurring uh, with what's, with regards to, you know, everything that's happening right now. Uh, it's been a long time coming. So I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity and thanks again, Jackie, for having us in, and bringing the subject to, to the forefront, for, you know. You're quite welcome, you're quite welcome. Um, for Sina, thank you for your comments. For Sina? Um, I would just like to say that this piece is very on par with the Academy's mission, which is why I was so excited when Micah uh, texted me, For Sina, I have a favor. <laughs> uh, I was actually <laughs> delighted to hear from him. Uh, we've known each other for years, and mm -hmm. he mentioned <laughs> to me a while back, Hey, I'm writing this play, film play I'm writing this, I'm writing this piece this thing I said great tell me about it and uh, I, I've been enjoying watching the evolution mm -hmm. of the piece and then he said well I'm going to take it to New York well thanks <laughs> <laughs> thanks a lot and uh, uh, lo and behold, I have a, a silver lining in this cloud that we all have. And I have this opportunity to not only um, hear it, but be a part of it, part of something that I thought I would only participate with my dear friend from afar because he was going to be somewhere else. And now we get to experience it together. And Academy's, Academy's mission, we do pieces that try to promote, inspire, or invoke psychological change. I mean this hits the nail on the head. So thank you and um, Micah Penn for not going to New York <laughs> this year. I think that term, that term, the Lord willing Ooh, uh, yeah. from James, sure. the book of James is coming to play very much so uh, because we can make all the plans thank in the you, world. Jackie. But uh, COVID-19 <laughs> has uh, told us that we're not uh, in our yes. right. Hopefully my, uh, Micah, uh, New York will right. see your play. But in the meantime, <laughs> we're really uh, very pleased that you're, uh, you're sharing it with us here and now in the moment with what Absolutely. we do. So thank you for that. Russell, any comments from you? Definitely, definitely. Um, I, I just think this piece is so relevant, so timely um, to bring us all together. It's crazy. It's interesting because you, can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, but you, you look back at maybe the civil rights era or history and, and every time you see video snippets or, or whatever it might be it's always in black and white right always you see it as if it's this distant oh that was way back then oh that was so far ago but you bring up a piece like this 1906 which really was not that long ago I mean that, that's a, a few generations um, so mm. to see these same parallels happening in today's society, it's like, okay, we need to learn from these things. We need, and, and I think bringing this to the forefront, like Micah said, being able to, to, to broadcast this and show this um, on, a, on a bigger stage where people can really digest it and say, wow, this is right here. This is only about a hundred or so years ago. What are we doing to break that cycle? Mm -hmm. What are we doing to change? Exactly. Um, and, and I think that that's something that, that's so important. Uh, so just happy to be a part of the process. I uh, love being a part of the new play process and 
and all those things that come with that. Well, it's certainly great to hear from you, uh, being a young um, young man, a uh, recent graduate, uh, recent in my terms, uh, 2016 <laughs> from the University of Georgia. That's great. And um, I see Brenda, uh, are you, would you give us a few words? I, I see your hand there. Uh, yes, I uh, <laughs> have known Micah for a long time and I'm very pleased and very proud of him for this work, but I, um, I would like to say, Micah, that I think it's no accident that it happens here in Atlanta where it, where it started, where the riot started, and that Atlanta has become the, um, the ground from which our whole movement that's happening now has begun. Um, so I know that you want to take it to New York. Um, and, and I'm I never going to let me forget that, are you? <laughs> no, no. And I understand why. I mean, it, 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 having read the play, it's, it's meant for a large, a large space. Um, and I think that it'll make a great movie as well. And you and I have talked mm -hmm. about that. But mm -hmm. I, I think that it's a wonderful, the, the COVID has made it so that it might have to, the seed might have to start here, just as the movement of today mm -hmm. has started here in Atlanta. And I, and I would like to say this, um, the one thing that uh, researching this history and learning about this event brought to light was the fact that so many of the civil rights, um, really iconic people uh, that we came to know in the early 20th century, all came out of here, came from this riot, came from Atlanta. Um, Many people know the name of Dr. Du Bois, uh, but many people don't know that he wrote The Soul of Black Folks when he was here in Atlanta. Many people don't know that um, they came to him here in Atlanta to ask him to be a part of the NAACP and then left and went to New York from here. Um, I use Walter White, the former head of the NAACP as my narrator because in his autobiography, the very first chapter of his autobiography is this event because Walter White is from Atlanta. And so, um, and it's very interesting to me that the year that Walter White died um, is the year that Emmett Till uh, was murdered and the year that Rosa Parks stood up for herself and Dr. King came onto the scene, another man from Atlanta. Um, all of those, all, none of that was lost on me, that so many of these people who were at the forefront of civil rights and, and many of the other characters who were in um, the play, who are not characters, they were actually real life people. They all were members of the NAACP at some point. Uh, they all were very smart and began to work systemically after the riot um, to better the lives of black people here in Atlanta and, and you know, progressing and never stopped. Um, even Maynard Jackson's grandfather who was there doing the riot, John Wesley Dobbs, um, what he did in the 1940s, registering over 20,000 people to vote. And he's the person that Killer Mike was referring to that actually got the first police officers on the Atlanta police force. He went to William Hartsfield, uh, who was the mayor at the time, and asked for those police officers to be hired. So, um, so much is entwined. So many things come straight out of here uh, that so many people really don't even realize or know. Um, that's a big part of what I discovered doing this. And I think all of us who are from Metro Atlanta kind of have always felt this just because of so many things that we grew up with during the civil rights era in the 60s. Um, we kind of felt like that was our thing. We had no idea that it started 100 years earlier. And it was our thing then. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, you know, um, Brent, Brenda, did you have another point that you wanted to um, comment on? Yes, I, I did want to say that one of the things I love about the piece, Micah, is that there is so much history that we learn through it. If we did not know it, you have a wonderful way 
of giving us the history and yet also in the script and in the stories of these people's life, you have, you let us into the everyday um, living of these people and what was going on in the conversations and the, the, you take the real life characters and have built the characters so that they live for us. And I, I think that that's a really wonderful thing. And I wanted to congratulate you on that. Here, here, I, I agree with that as well, uh, Brenda. I mean, when I uh, listened to the piece about the, the judge who um, had generated over $100,000, mm -hmm. I thought, oh my gosh, this is exactly the issue uh, that had been brought up in Ferguson about how people had been mm -hmm. kept down so much through the judicial system because they had these various fines that they were charged and they couldn't pay. And there was just this uh, continuous a loop of being in the judicial system and um, not being able to get out of it because there was not the money to get out of it because they couldn't pay the fines. So um, the parallels, uh, the politics, the media, the issue of you know protecting white virginity, uh, it's just, it's a very, very deep, um, deep piece that you have and then utilizing the various ones. And I, it's like, it's made me think like, oh my goodness, when's the last time I paid my NAACP dues? So <laughs> um, we're, we're looking at a lot of great new organizations and thank God for them. Mm -hmm. But what about the legacy uh, organizations that are doing things legally and have been doing it for years? So I think this play is something that we really need to bring to the attention of the NAACP uh, as well, because a, a lot of their, their history is, is involved as, as well in that piece. And so I really um, commend you on it. Now we have others in our audience. Uh, this is like um, if we were in the theater, if you have any questions or anything, just raise your hand or uh, give me some kind of signal and uh, you know you have an opportunity to ask questions as well. Anybody else with uh, any particular questions? Well, while people are deciding um, whether or not they are going to uh, ask questions, I um, think we, sh we should bring up the fact that um, there are a number of University of Georgia graduates that <laughs> are involved in this uh, production. So mm -hmm. uh, let's identify ourselves. Including, start with you, Jackie <laughs> Wright. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, oh gosh, I was telling uh, Micah, I don't want to go back with the year, but yes, I'm a uh, graduate <laughs> of the University of Georgia. Yes. Um, 1981, my drama degree, and in 1984, I got a journalism degree. And why did I get uh, two degrees? Number one, uh, my first love was, journal was, was uh, actually theater, and I wanted to go to New York. Uh, and um, after I uh, walked out of the uh, Sanford Stadium with my degree, I looked over my right shoulder and I saw my daughter who was elementary school age and also my teenage uh, sister uh, who was going to Clark Central at the time that I, had, I was raising uh, because of my parents' early demise. And so I looked at the two of them and I said, oh my God. I can't go to New York with these kids and be a starving art artist. It took me, you know, why didn't I figure out that before? I don't know. But as I walked out and I looked at them and I lifted up my eyes, because I said at the time, I said, what am I going to do? I can't take these kids to New York. And I saw the journalism school. Right by the stadium. <laughs> Yay school. Oh, yeah. That's, that's has a certain element of performance. Let me, let me, let me enroll. So that very, the next um, uh, Monday, I went to the J school, got involved, and I got my second degree in journalism so that I would be able to um, uh, feed my, my, my child and my sister, <laughs> and then also have some passion about what I was doing. So I'm 81, 84, University of Georgia. Yes. <laughs> Okay, Brenda Porter. Well, I'm a theater major from UGA. Go dogs. Um, <laughs> one, of, one of the one percent that attended while I was there, um, and um, I, 
I guess that's all I have to say. I'm just very happy to have to know the people that I met and have kept as friends yeah. all of these many, many years. Yeah. And then Russell. Russell is also a UGA grad, so and awesome. he was also a part of Russell was also a part of the theater company that I had been a part of when I was an undergrad. So that's actually how Russell and I met. So anything to say, Russ? <laughs> Yeah, no, I was, uh, as Micah mentioned, uh, I was a part of the Black Theatrical Ensemble on campus at UGA. Um, I actually did a business degree, but I ended up staying to finish out a theater minor, so couldn't, couldn't leave without, without getting that done. Yeah, and he was good, too. He was really good. Uh, when, when we were in school, they used to say you graduate uh, magna summa or O. So it was magna cum, magna, cum, magna cum laude, summa cum laude, and O laude. I, oh, I graduated O laude. Um, yeah, yeah. But I do have the degree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I was really uh, very, Athens uh, was a very interesting um, um, place for me. Um, most recently, I have one of my dear friends um, that I connected with at one of the film festivals around my film. And um, she happens to be a white woman that I have loved all ever since I met her from the University of Georgia, but she's very much a Trump supporter. So mm -hmm. it was interesting. Uh, she um, recently broke this, uh, this little blurb on Twitter about they were wanting to rename and take down the statues and everything. And, and how did I feel about that? Didn't we have a, a pleasant time uh, at the University of Georgia? <laughs> and I told her, I said, hey, I was so busy fighting racism that I didn't even know what the names of the, of the, uh, <laughs> the particular buildings were, dealing with some of the racist um, instructors that I had. But one right. of the things about it is, um, and I love the fact that she and I can still have dialogues and, and everything, because she was shocked that I, that was my experience and very saddened uh, because we knew some of the same um, professors and everything. And she was just really surprised that I was having a different experience than she did after all these years uh, we hadn't connected in over 30 years. And that's one of the things in dealing with um, the aspects of your play, it's very much um, how the human a character reacts to things like, uh, the scene where uh, the the um, black men were saying, "Hey, uh, we're not going to be like Memphis. We're not going to be like New Orleans. We're getting guns. We're going to do something, right. and we're going to protect ourselves." You know, uh, and I think that's kind of uh, where we are today, where people are not only working through organizations, but they're also looking at what do I do in my guerrilla warfare moment to protect myself, to protect my family. And hopefully there's going to be more dialogue and your play definitely uh, will stimulate more dialogue where people need to really get involved with their local politics. That's where a lot of it begins and makes a difference. And once again, uh, if there's anyone that would like to ask a question or make a comment, uh, you're welcome to do so as well. So um, I'll, I'll make a comment and maybe have a question too. Okay. My name is Akbar Motep. I've known Brenda for a long, long while and Francina for a minute as well. Mm -hmm. Actually, Brenda and I are from the same county in Georgia. I called her the city girl because she's from the big old international city. <laughs> and I'm from further south, but that's okay. <laughs> I, I'm not a UGA grad, but I can't say go dogs. But <laughs> okay. That's okay. I went there for one year of graduate school. Right. And having said that, uh, I really, really appreciate the historical aspect of the piece. I struggle, our hostess sees a lot of parallels that I don't see, but historically I connect totally. Parallelly, if that's a word, not so much. But uh, the names, you even see names like David Howard and Henry McNeil Turner and some others. Have, other than that, the other thing was the media. How sometimes it seems like stuff is driven by the media. And 
and I'll say that because on the on the night that things really blew up with the thing from George Floyd, nothing was happening for a long time. And the media had like 10 people out there watching every move, waiting for something to drop, something to fall, or something. And it's almost like if nothing had happened, they would have been disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that to say that the role that the media plays in driving stuff, I'm not a journalist person like the narrator or the hostess, but I think it's an overlooked aspect of a lot of stuff that happens within society. Not just picking up the paper or going to the internet to read about what's happening, but the actual pushing mm -hmm. of stuff mm -hmm. in an indirect way. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I, that's kind of aside from what you've written. But some work that I've done, dare I say research, a friend of mine and I work actually working on a piece about the riot itself for the Fulton County school system. Mm -hmm. And uh, and reading Alonzo Herndon's book, what I found out about that thing was how the paper Mm -hmm. was pushing those gubernatorial candidates. And I think you said one of them actually had the paper in his back pocket or something like that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I, I've spoken too much, but. No, uh, no, 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 that's, that's perfect. Actually, um, we're just reading uh, parts from different sections of the play. One of the things you would see if you had the whole play is the, new the newspaper thing is throughout the play because the newspapers were pushing all of this um, from the start. Um, the thing about Jesse Max Barber, Jesse Max Barber was a black newspaper man. Um, there were two um, black publications here in Atlanta during that time. And a conversation that I think uh, Russell and I were having offline uh, earlier before everything got started was about, and for Cena as well, was about how the newspapers were driving things one way and the black newspapers had to counteract, try to speak to everything that the white newspapers were pushing because the white newspapers were always skewing things in a really negative way uh, toward black people in everything. Okay. And, um, one of the things about Jesse Max Barber's uh, telegram, he sent that telegram that Russell read toward the end of our excerpts um, to the New York world. That was uh, Joseph Pulitzer's newspaper in New York. Okay. And um, uh, uh, what you call it? John Temple Graves had written that paper to try to play down what had happened in Atlanta because when this riot happened in Atlanta, the news of it went all over the country. It was a sensation. People in the North and in the West were shocked. Nobody expected a race riot in Atlanta. The other Southern cities, yeah. But Atlanta had become more the, the, the New York of the South, the Chicago of you know this part of the country. And so they didn't expect this kind of thing to erupt in Atlanta at that time because Atlanta was considered very progressive. And when it happened, it was all driven. The riot itself was literally driven by the Atlanta Evening News printing these, these bogus, literally fake news attacks about white women being attacked. Okay. And, and they were coming out every 30 minutes with a new one. Every and 30 minutes? Oh every my God. 30 minutes they came out with a new one. And one of the parts we don't have in here um, that we just didn't have room or time to read today was that even the mayor of Atlanta himself had said that these things can't possibly be true. They're just coming out too soon for them to even in those days to get that kind of information, to verify it. Very often what they did was they took a story that was nothing black woman white woman got scared because a black man brushed up against her mm -hmm. and they were literally taking that as black man across white woman blah 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 and printing it in the newspapers yes. um, and okay. let me say one other thing okay 
the newspapers actually drove riots in cities all over this country. They did it in Wilmington, North Carolina. They did it in um, Tulsa, Oklahoma. They did it in um, Phillips County, Arkansas. They did it in several of the most famous race riots that have happened and the worst uh, race riots that have happened. Well, I, shouldn't, I don't even like to call them race riots, they're massacres. These rampages by white people against black people, the newspapers were complicit or were a direct cause in probably 75% of them, the newspapers. Okay. Um, you know. Yeah, so I could yeah. I could say something else um, in terms of media, and I, I just would like to remind people that the media is made up of individuals, and those individuals have particular mindsets based on their training mm -hmm. and uh, who they interact with uh, every day. And so many times, some of the stories that you uh, get is um, because of the people that have access to those uh, media people. So that the media is something that uh, people need to follow up on as well. When they see something wrong in the paper, they need to pick up the phone and they need to call the paper. They need to uh, call the news director. Uh, more and more nowadays, um, there are less and less public affairs shows. One of the reasons that public affairs shows came on uh, the scene was because of the fact that there was just always just crime and negative news about um, black people or minority people. And so that's why the particular papers used to have like the community section, uh, the black folks section, that sort of thing. And there were public affairs shows so that we could hear some positive news about um, people of other races because there's no time in especially television news uh, to be able to get all the crime stories in. And then at the end, maybe you might get that, uh, what they call a kicker. It's a minute and uh, 30 seconds, 90 seconds against all of the other news that you've had about in a negative way. So the media is very much something that um, people should talk about and they should react, pick up the phone and not just let it roll off their back. And that's one of the reasons that uh, I love the San Francisco Black Film Festival so much because it's an opportunity for other voices other films that you don't see in mainstream media to be able to be placed so that there could be some difference um, in ideas and everything. And so we're getting near our time and I, I wanna just make sure before I wrap up if there's any other comments or anything um, that's burning issues or anything that somebody wants to bring up. I wanna be egalitarian about this. Hey Jackie, this is um, Jack on West Fun, and I'm so glad to see you. I wanted to say something <laughs> earlier, but uh, we'll have to talk offline. Mike, okay. thank you so much for doing this important work. Uh, I'm so thankful that you stayed the course. I know it takes a lot of time and effort to put together something of this magnitude. So thank you for, for not allowing this history to be lost. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. So I uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate uh, appreciate that. You know, uh, as I began, um, some of you might have uh, come in late. Um, we got the very um, terrible news um, that our festival director, Callie O'Ray, had passed. And it just shook me to my core. And especially in light of the fact that uh, he died as a result of COVID-19. and. Mm -hmm. It just, you know, um, thinking that if different actions had been taken, Callie, along with so many others, wouldn't they be with us today? Or the expectation is that they would be with us today. So I really um, appreciate you uh, continuing uh, to, to work with me to have this reading because uh, the ideas that came across, uh, the possibility of it being, um, Micah, this being uh, something for a film, 
it, mm -hmm. it's very important to have good stories. Um, we kicked off uh, what we, we call these, these as uh, live talk at SFBFF, and we kicked it off with Ty Manns. And I don't know if you're familiar with him or not, but he is in the South. He, there is another production company besides Tyler Perry. <laughs> uh, so this black man by the name of Ty Manns um, is very much a, a script writer. And a lot of his um, films are very inspirationally based. And one thing that he talked about was the power of a story, the power of a script. And if you don't have that, uh, forget about your film. And so it's just so great um, that we're having this dialogue that, um, you know, that might start here at the San Francisco Black Film Festival, you and Brenda and others will make sure that uh, that film comes forth. You know, there's so many aspects of what you can do with this play, not only to do it as a feature in some dramatic uh, way, but I think there's a room for a documentary around it and uh, the mm. how and why of your, yep. your doing this. So there's so many different elements um, that can be done. And so we, we really appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, you were able to, um, to uh, share with us and everything, and especially at this time when our heart, our hearts in San Francisco are broken, uh, really broken, yeah. and uh, it's we're utilizing the um, the internet, and of course, you know, there's always issues about uh, you know sometimes connectivity and things like that. But I think we we press through, and and that's a, a very good thing, and it's kind of uh, interesting that you know you're bringing some solace to us uh, from Atlanta uh, on behalf of, for Katira Crossley, who's the co-director, and Kali O'Reilly, um, who was the love of her life. And then we also think about you in, in Atlanta, where you have had some, some pains as well with uh, the passing of uh, yes. Congressman Lewis, yes. uh, uh, C.T. Uh, Vivian, and uh, there have been some other unfortunate um, deaths that have happened in the community as well. So we uh, of the San Francisco Black Film Festival extend our condolences to you as well. So I really appreciate uh, everybody uh, that's been a part of this today. And uh, please uh, check out sfbff.org to see what's going on. And um, you know, sign up for some of the up updates, and just bear with us as we are in new territory. Um, it, it's this um, just a sad time for us, but we're going to try try to make it the best way we can. And with our friends, um, we're going to do that um, for, with our our media friends and our our friends that volunteer, um, the ones that help uh, help out. I see Dr. Hickman uh, from the. 100 Black Women of San Francisco is on the line, and they were instrumental in providing uh, interns, young interns, to help out with some of the social media media postings, and and uh, it was part of the Doris Ward work uh, workforce development program. And Doris Ward was uh, the first Black woman to be uh, president of the Board of Supervisors for uh, San Francisco, and she was a member of the uh, 100 Black Women as well. And so our young um, people that got involved were able to learn some history. Uh, they were able to learn some techniques around social media and everything. And there's just so much that can be done. Uh, I also see uh, Jenna Snow, who worked a long time with um, the um, Lorraine Hansberry Theater formerly, um, is on the line. And it's just great to see her. And she happens to be a Caucasian woman. Um, who has been very helpful in getting um, the word out about um, equal rights and that sort of thing through the avenue of Black theater. So, you know, uh, the San Francisco Black Film Festival is multicultural. Our friends are multicultural and everything, and we just uh, appreciate all of them. And so with that being said, um, I will, if there's nothing else, anybody else wants to add, we are going to um, chat offline. Thank you, Jackie. Okay, thanks well, everybody. Thank you. Wonderful we, event. Thank we you. We so appreciate it. Thank you.